Okay, welcome to lecture seven. This lecture will be about uh, parallel elements. Okay, so um, what are parallel elements? Well, you might recall from uh, previous uh, lectures uh, that systems, flexure systems, um, as defined by Stuart Smith, remember, uh, consist of rigid bodies that are connected together by flexible elements that guide them to achieve some prescribed uh, motion or degrees of freedom or some kind of performance, right? And so, so to be a system, you need to consist of rigid bodies, uh, which in my schematic I show as just uh, big rectangles, right? Those are, represent rigid bodies. And they need to be joined together by flexure elements, which in this schematic are shown as this classic um, symbol for a spring. Okay, so you can see um, there are three kinds of flexure systems. Okay, there are parallel, serial, and hybrid. Okay, and um, of course the, the rigid bodies can take on many different shapes. And here it, it is actually an extruded 3D rectangle. Here. These are extruded 3D rectangles, but here um, they're extruded triangles, and uh, these thick portions here are uh, the rigid bodies. Okay, so the rigid just because I draw them as rectangles doesn't mean that's just an abstraction and a schematic. Okay, they can be anything. And similarly, the uh, springs or the flexure elements, um, you know, can can take on many different forms as well. So in this example. We used wires as the spring. They're a kind of spring that stiffens things in certain directions along their axis and it's compliant in all other directions. The, the, the springs or the elements can be flexure blades, okay, which obviously have different constraint characteristics. And then the springs in this schematic can also be uh, living hinge flexures, okay, uh, which we'll be talking about a bit in this. But these are the three most common flexure elements, but they're infinite other flexure elements or, or springs that deform over their entire geometry to constrain bodies that they join to not move in certain ways but allow them to freely move in other ways with high compliance, okay? And so, like I said, so the, 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 the rectangles can be any shape in reality, the springs can be almost any shape uh, in reality, okay, as long as they deform and constrain certain directions, etc. Okay, um, and these systems that consist of both rectangles and springs, right, rigid bodies and flexible elements, they are, like I said, are categorized into three different categories. This is a parallel system. Parallel systems always consist of two bodies joined directly together uh, in parallel, okay, which means, of course, that they will uh, experience, uh, you know, all the flexures that are attached to it will experience not the same force, but the same displacements, right? Uh, you guys remember from uh, simple physics, uh, what, what makes springs or even, you know, um, uh, classifies them as in, in, in series or parallel. Uh, and what, what does that is, is if they experience the same displacement, you can imagine if this stage moves up, these will all displace the same amount. Um, but depending on the stiffness of these, if, they're, if one's stiffer than another spring, then they will experience uh, different forces. They'll pull back on a different way. The, the stiffer spring will, will pull back with a bigger force. Whereas if you put springs in series and you load them, uh, you know, each spring, depending on if they're different stiffnesses, some are stiff or some are compliant, um, will not experience the same displacement. Some will displace more than others, but what will be the same is it'll be the same force through them. So parallel and series are different. Okay, parallel things experience the same displacement, not the same force. Series things experience the same force, but not the displacement. So they're kind of opposite, okay? So that's another way to identify if things are parallel. But um, according to my definition, parallel flexure systems always need to have um, two rigid bodies joined directly together by flexure elements. And as we'll learn, those need to be parallel flexure elements, okay? But, but I haven't told you about that yet, okay? And then serial flexure systems consist of uh, two or more parallel systems stacked or nested in a chain-like configuration. In this case, you had two of them, uh, two parallel systems stacked, okay? And then hybrid systems are any other configuration and typically consist of combinations of, of 
uh, serial and parallel limbs uh, arranged in parallel and series, you know, just different combinations, okay? So you can see this one is actually uh, an interconnected hybrid uh, system here, okay? But, but I haven't defined what that is just yet. But anyway, this is a hybrid example. This is a famous stage that uh, moves with just two translations. If you ever just want to move X and Y, X and Y, uh, and every combination of those, the disk of translations, that's a great uh, flexure to do it, to cut it out of a planar piece, okay? Okay, so like I said, so hopefully that clarifies what systems are and what elements are and the different kinds of systems, okay? Um, now let's talk a little bit more about elements. So far, you guys are just really familiar with wires and blades. We haven't really done living hinge flexures. Um, but uh, these are the three most common you will see in precision engineering and, and in most uh, compliant mechanisms. And the reason they're the most common, at least uh, to date, um, is because they are um, the easiest to fabricate and assemble or not assemble. You know, you can cut them with a single planar piece oftentimes. And then they're, you know, they're, they're, they lend themselves well to most fabrication approaches. Um, they're also pretty easy to visualize their kinematics. So, um, you know, most uh, previous designers, when they arrange these constraints, they need to be able to visualize what they, what degrees of freedom they constrain and what they allow, and they're they're much more easy to manage than than other designs. Um, so that's the second reason they're most common. Then the third reason is they're really all anyone knows. After a while, if this is all you see, then this is all you think you can use, right? And so, um, so that's why you see these all over the field. Um, but there are an infinite number of springs or you know, elements that can take on infinite number of shapes and geometries that can constrain certain directions very stiffly and yet allow other directions with great compliance and deform over the entire geometry and therefore cl classify themselves as an element. Okay? These are all examples of uh, parallel elements here. Okay? But again, like what, I, I, you know, what's a parallel element? You don't know that yet. Okay? But these are, what my point is this thus far is there's a lot more elements than just wires, blades, and living hinges, okay? This is not by any means a comprehensive library. This is just a ton, a bunch to show you uh, that there are many, okay? So, um, okay, so how is it useful to know about other flexible elements? Well, just an example, say I had... Um, Say, say I gave you a challenge. Say I wanted you to make a parallel system that consisted, of course, two rigid bodies, the top and the bottom, and I wanted uh, you to achieve a screw degree of freedom and, and constrain all the other uh, motions possible. It just achieves a single screw with a single pitch. Okay? And say, but you're limited to only use wires, blades, and living hinges. Okay? And you have to use them to directly connect these two bodies. Uh, in a parallel way. Well, your options would be very limited. It's actually impossible to achieve a screw with a parallel system uh, with, if you use even a single hin living hinge or blade. Uh, you can't use a hinge or blade to achieve a screw with a parallel configuration here. And so the only option would be to use wires. And uh, you know, you know that you have to have at least five wires to be exactly constrained. This is obviously heavily over constrained. They all lie within the constraint space, though. And you get this nasty rat's nest here that wouldn't be uh, terribly um, reliable. You know, these these could break easily, um, and uh, very difficult to fabricate. Um, and and so you don't really have too many good options. Okay. So. Um, but there are many, other, oh, and by the way, the pitch of this will change over its range. Uh, say you want that screw to keep the same, you know, location, orientation, axis, and everything, but also keep the same pitch over its full range. This one will, as you translate it and it rotates, the, the, the translation per rotation ratio uh, will, will change um, over its range in, in an undesired way. So th there's really no good solution, okay? if you're limited to just wires, blades, and, and living hinges. Well, if you can open yourself up to much more uh, non-intuitive creative flexure elements, like these hyperbolic paraboloid flexures um, that look very uh, bizarre, um, then you can achieve uh, 
screws in many other ways in a parallel fashion. You can see there's just uh, the stage and then the ground, there's just two bodies. Um, these are just extensions from the ground, right? And, uh, and this achieves uh, a nice screw. So you can see it kind of looks like uh, Batman or something flapping, flapping its wings or its cape or something. Okay? And, uh, and, and, you know, there's many, many others. That's just one example of how you could do things in a parallel way, c directly connecting two rigid bodies. You could also use circular hyperboloid flexures. Okay? And uh, you can see this design you know, as you translate a delta x, it will also rotate delta theta with a specific pitch. Okay, here's an animation of it working from an isometric view. And uh, this is a much more robust way to achieve a screw um, motion uh, compared to the wire example. And um, the, the, the real benefit of this way is that uh, it maintains the same pitch over its full range, interestingly enough. I'm, I'm not sure why, it just happens to. We, we actually built this, we 3D printed it, and then loaded it with weights here. You can see in with a camera, we saw how much it rotated uh, here, you know, or sorry, how much it displaced here, and then in this view above, we saw how much it rotated. And we plotted the stage displacement versus stage rotation, and you can see, we, we did a finite element analysis, it's much clearer to show over large ranges uh, the slope of this uh, line remains constant. Of course, the slope is the pitch, okay? Um, and then here's the experimental data. Uh, it's, it's still pretty, pretty straight, okay? Whereas if you did the wires, uh, that would not be nonlinear and the pitch would change, okay? So th the point of all this is, is if you're, uh, you're open-minded enough to use the infinite uh, kinds of spring resources you have available, or element resources you have available instead of just wires, blades, and living hinges, you can achieve uh, many more designs that might be much better, okay? And of course, the downside is most of the other designs are di more difficult to fabricate, but with the advent of 3D printing, which uh, this was made using, uh, that makes it uh, negligible, okay? And as 3D printing gets better and better with metals and titanium and, and these things for affordable prices, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a moot uh, point, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> turns out there are, just like there are three kinds of flexure systems that consist of rigid bodies and flexible elements, uh, there are three kinds of elements, um, right? Where elements are like the springs that deform over their full geometry, okay? Um, and they have, they're, the, they're called the same categories. They're either parallel, serial, or hybrid, okay? And, and so, first of all, you might see in their schematic, you don't have any big rectangles that mean rigid bodies because there's no rigid body. I mean, in this drawing, this and this would be the rigid body, but the element we're, we're showing here is, is just the blade in the example, okay? So pretend these didn't exist. The reason we drew them is to show the two ends that they connect, okay? But in the schematic of just an element, we don't have big rigid rectangles. And um, instead, we have these points that join them. So, this is obviously a parallel element, but now what if you take a blade and you bend it so it's a crease here? Well, now it's essentially two parallel elements in series, and so that makes a serial element. Now, this wouldn't be considered a system because here's just the two ends it joins, and you can just forget about these being rigid bodies. There is just this whole thing deforms over its entire range, and there's no rigid body that makes it a system. So when you draw it in the schematic, you, you draw it with a point there, okay? Because what they do is they connect at points, lines, in this case it's a line, or curve. So if they connect, if parallel elements join at points, lines, or curves so that uh, there's really no rigid body at their junction, uh, you know, then, then they're going to be a, a serial uh, or hybrid element, right? So here's an example of a hybrid element. Uh, you can see, that, again, all these are just made of the parallel element blade. This is a serial and this is a hybrid, uh, uh, actually interconnected hybrid. Um, or no, no, sorry, that's not interconnected hybrid. That, that's a hybrid, but you, you don't know what that is yet, so don't worry about it. Okay, so that, that's, um, this is just a hybrid element, um, and notice there's no rigid bodies in between. It's saying the whole thing deforms, okay? So, so you're starting to see there's many, many different ways you can get springs and elements that deform over their entire range, and um, it's it's important um, that, uh, you know, you classify them in these three categories, 
Um, same thing, it's important you classify systems in the three categories. And first of all, let me tell you why it's important you use my definitions. Um, you know, full disclosure, there are Flexure uh, designers who would disagree with my definitions on occasion. Um, and and uh, and that you know that's fine. Some definitions can be uh, a little um, ambiguous as long as people understand what you're talking about. But it's very critical for this course and anything you use fact to design that you stick with my definitions. I, I had to change minor tweaks to certain well-defined definitions so that fact would work. Okay, so. So, um, you know, uh, it's going to be more and more important you understand what a parallel serial and hybrid system are according to my definitions and what a parallel serial and hybrid element are according to my definitions. And uh, if you stick to those definitions and you use fact to design or analyze something, you'll always get the correct answer. Whereas if you use other people's definitions using fact, you won't get the correct answer, which is, which is why I changed the definitions, okay? Um, so, so it would work all the time. So definitions are very important uh, in this course. Okay, for these these six different classifications, um, you know, three for elements and three for s systems. But uh, all right, parallel serial and hybrid. Okay, so so what is the definition then? We're, th the point of this lecture is to talk about parallel elements. Okay, we're going to talk about serial and hybrid elements in future lectures, but th this entire lecture is dedicated to parallel elements. Okay, so. What is the, the rigorous definition, according to fact, of a parallel element? Well, an element is parallel if it satisfies these two conditions. Okay, so let me read them to you. Um, if constraint lines can be drawn, and so constraint lines are the blue lines, right? If constraint lines can be drawn directly from one rigid body to the next, okay? So say you've got an element connecting two rigid bodies. That's always, elements always connect two rigid bodies together. That's what a joint is. These are flexible joints and they join two rigid bodies. That's what springs do. They, they have two ends and you join the two together. So, so, um, so if constraint lines, the blue, you know, pure force wrench vectors can be drawn directly from one rigid body to the next and pass entirely through the element's geometry, you know, without exiting it at any point, and if such constraint lines can fill the element's entire geometry, then the element is a parallel flexor element, okay? So those two conditions are critical. So it's probably difficult to understand what I mean by these, so I'll give a bunch of examples. Okay, so let's look at a wire, okay? Um, let me ask the question, can a blue line be drawn between the two bodies that the wire connects, this one and this one, and pass entirely through the element's geometry without exiting any point? Yes, it can, it's that blue line. That never exits the geometry of the wire, okay, and it connects those. Does it entirely fill its geometry? Well, yes, if it's an idealized wire that's infinitely thin, et cetera, it, it, it does fill the, there's no part in there that's not drawn blue now, okay? And so this is a parallel element. It is the most basic parallel element, as we've talked about, and its constraint space is just a single blue line, which makes it the most basic, okay? It's an order of constraint of one, right? Okay, so um, what about a blade flexure? Okay, you know, say here's the two bodies, it connects. Can you draw blue lines that connect those two bodies and pass entirely through its geometry? Uh, that's condition one. Yes, like that one works, that one works, that one works, that one works. You know, and, and all those work, right? So anything on that plane will pass entire, connect the two rigid bodies um, without interruption and will will pass entirely through the geometry. And can they be made to fill it? Yes, you could draw lines that satisfy that first condition and fill this entirely blue, which satisfies the second condition. And therefore, um, this is also a parallel element. And of course, its constraint space is the linear combination of all those pure force wrench vectors that make, you know, just an infinitely large blue plane, okay? And its order of constraint, by the way, remember, Remember, uh, let me just remind you from a previous lecture that, um, right, um, remember we, we showed that, um, you know, th there, th this is, the, the, technically, the blade flexure would be heavily over-constrained. After you do its three independent constraints, any other constraint you add, you know, all these blue lines uh, beyond the original three would be, um, over constraining, redundantly constraining the system mathematically. But it's not useful to consider these as over constrained um, because they, the, largely the negative effects of over constraints aren't 
blatantly present, like, and they are. You, you will more over constrain a system with a with a blade than a wire, um, but uh, you know. But but it's not useful to think of them as over constrained. It's more useful to think of them as having an order of constraint of three. So you treat it. An element in and of itself usually, usually is not an assembled body. It's just a, a, a single spring that's made in one piece. And, and uh, you consider them as, as not being over constrained. It, mathematically, yes, but you know, on an exam, if I ever asked it, or in reality, if you're ever using these, you do not consider this over constrained. You say it's over constrained of three. And remember, there's other blue wires, blue lines that can fit in this wire. Um, that aren't just that single straight one if that wire has any diameter thickness that's not infinitely small or infinitesimal, right? And so there's other blue lines that could fit in there that would also uh, redundantly constrain um, and, and actually even change the freedom space of that wire. And so, so in reality, and, you know, and this would also have blue lines that go angled if this, ha if this blade has any actual finite thickness. And, for it to be a perfect plane, this has to be infinitely thin, which it obviously never actually is. Okay, we're going to talk about sensitivity of constraint spaces uh, later, which is what I'm kind of hinting at here. But um, the point is, is that everything in reality, every element has some degree of over constraint, but it's not useful, um, you know, to 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 think of it that way. It's, it's more useful to consider these things with orders of constraint. Okay. And uh, the higher the order of constraint, sure, it has a little, in practicality, a little more, um, you know, uh, issues with over constraint and redundancy. But, uh, you know, you don't usually have to worry about that unless you're getting to picometer kind of resolutions and these kind of things, okay? Um, and precision, okay? So don't, don't consider any element over constrained, okay? Including a living hinge flexor here, okay? So let, let's look at this one. Does it, is this a parallel element? Well, sure. I can, you know, here's its two obviously rigid bodies. Here's the flexible portion. I can draw blue lines that uh, connect them and don't exit the geometry at any point. There's that one, there's that one, there's that one. There's even these angled ones. There's all these angled ones. And, and so if you filled it, basically, uh, so, so first of all, there are many blue lines that can satisfy the first condition, connect the two bodies, not exit the geometry. And then, uh, if you draw them all, they will fill the entire geometry, and so uh, you make it entirely blue, which satisfies the second condition. So sure enough, this is a parallel element, um, and sure enough, its constraint space is is essentially you know approximately this. You know, you'd have to have a perfect two triangles together to kind of um, be this, um, and, and you can see this is kind of circular here, but, but you know, approximately it, it's constraint space. Most of the blue lines are going to lie on these intersecting blue planes, and, and therefore uh, the freedom space that that maps to will be a rotation. So but let's, let's see this. So, so basically the point is these are all uh, parallel systems. They satisfy those two conditions, and, and they are all uh, not over constrained. Mathematically, they are all, yes, redundantly constrained. But you don't consider that they all have orders of constraint. So, so memorize that. No element is in and of itself over constrained by itself as a single standalone thing. Okay, it's just not useful to think of that. That way, they have orders of constraint. Okay, so let's look at the wire. Okay, the wire here comes from five DF type one, obviously, order of constraint of one. Its freedom space is all this stuff, intersecting red planes here, and all the screws and translations perpendicular. Okay. Here is the blade we've seen many times. Its constraint space is this blue plane, and then therefore its freedom space is that red plane with the translation arrow, and its order of constraint is three. We know this. Okay. Here we know, so here the, the intersecting blue planes come from 1DOF type 1. Okay. And of course, its uh, freedom space is a single red rotation line. That's why those just act as uh, living hinges. They just have a single rotation about their central axis there where these intersecting blue planes intersect, okay? And it, again, it's, it's, it, it is more over constrained technically and mathematically than the other two. Um, you know, when you add reality, there's gray area here and nothing's perfectly exactly constrained, okay? Um, so there, but, and there's more over constraint, there's more gray area on this one than any of the other ones, but you don't consider it over constrained. You say it has an order of constraint of five, okay? Okay. All right. So, 
Okay, so now let's look at, so since we have this chart, we can uh, generate, uh, you know, an infinite number of parallel elements, um, you know, from, from the fact chart, okay? So since we have the fact chart and it is a finite, or it is a, an, a, an uh, you know, yeah, a finite chart with an infinite number of solutions within it, it does contain every possible parallel flexure, flexure element geometry that you could ever draw. And so you have access to all possible infinite parallel element geometries in this chart. And um, I'll show you just a few, okay, that are, that are useful and good to know about. And so you can kind of catch the idea that we're, we're teaching here. So this is a hyperbolic paraboloid uh, flexure, okay. Remember, this is the constraint space, okay. Um, re remember, uh, hyperbolic paraboloids consist of you know, they're, they're double ruled surfaces, but you know, we're just looking at one ruling of surfaces, one set of lines. So basically they're made entirely of lines, okay? And this blue line as it, as it translates along this direction kind of rotates with a very specific rotation. Or if you take the translation divided by its rotation, um, it would uh, take the double derivative, der double derivative of that uh, pitch, if you will, uh, would be constant. That's the, the rate that that rotates for it to be a hyperbolic paraboloid and to exhibit this freedom space, okay? So it's also important to note, and, and you can see, for, first of all, it's important to note that the two bodies that it would join would have to be stuck on this back surface would be one body, then this front surface here stuck on the other body. So you can see it's, it would be kind of sandwiched like that. Um, if you can see me, yeah, it'd be sandwiched kind of like, like that. There'd be, you know, two things it would sandwich. Um, and if you did that, you, you could convince yourself that, yes, indeed, um, you can draw uh, blue lines that connect the two rigid bodies that it joins and pass entirely through its geometry without ever exiting it, right? That's obvious because it's a ruled surface. So it satisfies the first condition, but the entire thing can be made blue. I didn't fill the entire thing blue, but you could make that entire thing blue. So it satisfies the second condition. So this is a parallel element, okay? Um, and, and just another point is, is it is critical to realize the different ends. You know, you could have stuck this end to that end or this end back there to this end. And it's critical that you realize which ends it's being stuck to because there are some examples um, that I'll, I'll get to where if you stick the two rigid bodies they join on two different ends, depending on the ends you stick them on, it could either be hybrid or, or sorry, parallel or serial or hybrid, okay? So it's not necessarily just the shape. It's, um, it's, it's where, you know, where the two bodies are attaching to that shape that, that uh, also make it uh, help affect its classification, okay? But again, if I fix the back here with one body and the front here with another body, then, you know, you can see this satisfies the parallel condition as a parallel flexure element, okay? Now, there would, of course, be another way you could attach the two bodies because it's a double-ruled surface, and there's another... Uh, set, you know, you can see the red lines here are complementary to these blue lines. And, and, and if you consider those blue and stuck uh, uh, the two bodies on it, um, that would also work. It would just switch the direction of the freedom space, okay? And of course, what's the order of constraint of this? Is this an over-constrained? Like, no, no element is by itself over-constrained. According to our definition, it just has an order of constraint of three. So six minus the degrees of freedom up here is three, and so and that, this is, by the way, what it looks like animated. You can see how beautiful that is there as it rotates. Okay, and its order of constraint is three. So it counts for three independent constraints just like a blade flexure does, okay? But, of course, three different independent constraints than the blade flexure. Okay, so another um, interesting one to know about is circular hyperboloid flexures, okay? You can see here uh, the, the sides that are important, you know, this would be one body and the, up here would be another body that it would attach to and join. And given that connection and the, its geometry, because it's a ruled surface again, um, uh, you know, you can, you can see that uh, there are plenty of blue lines that connect the two bodies directly without ever exiting its geometry. And you could fill that entirely blue. That's the second condition. And, and so therefore it's a parallel element, okay? And sure enough, uh, it's not over-constrained. No flexible element is. Um, uh, in, in practice, it has an order of constraint of 
3. Again, 6 minus 3 is 3. Okay? So let me just try and confuse you here. Say we took an, an entire, this was just a section of a circular hyperboloid. Let's take an entire circular hyperboloid structure here like this, okay? 